Hello, and welcome back to Scholastically Natalie, where we read books, talk about them, talk about writing, and sometimes D&D, and then at other times we pop up with some other weird stuff. So today I figured we could get back into Candide after I read you the introduction and then uh, left you alone with that for a bit. <laughs> I was expecting chapter one to be longer than I remembered it to be, but it's super, super short. I always forget that Candide is only like 128 pages long. <laughs> so we're reading chapter one. It is by Voltaire. And chapter one is called How Candide Was Brought Up in a Magnificent Castle and How He Was Expelled from It. In a castle in Westphalia, belonging to Monsieur the Baron of Thunder Ten Tronc, lived a youth on whom nature had bestowed the most gentle manners. His face was the mirror of his soul. He combined a true judgment with simplicity of spirit, which is the reason I understand that he was called Candide. Uh, note, Candide in French means candid. The old servants of the family suspected him of being the son of the baron's sister by a good, honest gentleman of the neighborhood, whom that young lady never wished to marry because he had been able to prove only seventy-one quarterings, the rest of his gene genealogical tree having been lost through the injuries of time. Another note here, uh, 71 is a truly ridiculous amount of quarterings. Um, that's like how far back you can trace your lineage, because apparently having 16 in the real world gives you a knighthood. <laughs> so once again, we have quite a bit of over-exaggeration. The Baron was one of the most powerful lords in Westphalia, for his castle had a gate and windows. There was even a tapestry hanging in his great hall. His farmyard dogs formed a hunting pack when needed, his grooms doubled as huntsmen, and the curate of the village served as his grand alimoner. They all called him my lord and laughed when he told stories. And here we're seeing this, you know, rather simplistic view versus the high standards of the world, which will definitely result in some odd times throughout the rest of this book. He's a powerful lord because he has a gate and windows, but also they won't marry people who can trace their family lineage back 71 quarterings. Uh, so it's a nice contrast of such simplistic uh, standards for those in power, and then also such uh, scathing standards for those below them. The baron's lady weighed about 350 pounds and was therefore a person of great consideration, and she performed the honors of the house with a dignity that commanded still greater respect. Again, we're having a call back to how being uh, rather rotund was greatly desired in the olden days, and also a joke, <laughs> because... She is overweight, and thus she must be a good person. Her daughter Cunegonde was seventeen years old, rosy-cheeked, fresh, plump, and desirable. The baron's son seemed to be in every respect worthy of his father. The preceptor Pangloss, um, which comes from Greek words meaning all and language, was the oracle of the family, and little Candide listened to his lessons with all the good faith of his age and character. Pangloss was professor of metaphysico theologico cosmolo nigology. He could prove admirably that there is no effect without a cause, and that, in this best of all possible worlds, the baron's castle was the most magnificent of castles, and his lady the best of all possible baronesses. And I just love this over-exaggeration of, like, <laughs> philosophy and the people who do much thinking and how they end up justifying their own evidence to suit their needs, which I always think is fascinating. It is proven, he said, that things cannot be otherwise than as they are. For all being created for an end, all is necessarily for the best end. Uh, so here he's saying that because things are created for a purpose, it has to be for the best purpose. Observe that noses have been formed to carry spectacles, so we have spectacles. 
Legs are visibly designed for breeches, and we wear breeches. Here, of course, <laughs> this logic doesn't make sense because we had legs uh, before we had breeches, and thus we made breeches because of how our legs were shaped, and we shaped glasses that way because of our noses. But again, the bias of wanting the evidence to support his opinion gives us this. Stones were made to be carved and to build castles, therefore my lord has a magnificent castle, for the greatest baron in the province ought to have the best residence. Pigs were made to be eaten, therefore we eat pork all the year round. So those who have asserted that all is well were talking nonsense. They should have said that all is for the best. Candide listened attentively and believed innocently. Because he found Miss Cunegonde extremely beautiful, though he never had the courage to tell her so, he concluded that after the great fortune of being born Baron of Thunder Ten Tronk, the second degree of happiness was to be Miss Cunegonde, the third that of seeing her every day, and the fourth that of listening to Master Pangloss, the greatest philosopher of the whole province, and consequently of the whole world. So... <laughs> I know because the first time I read this, I got kind of confused about whether Candide was the Baron or not, and then I was like, no, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> um, so here he's saying that you have to have the best fortune to be the Baron, and then perhaps the second best thing was to be Cunegonde, the third best thing was to see Cunegonde every day, and the fourth was to listen to Pangloss. One day, Cunegonde, while walking near the castle in a little wood that they called the park, saw Dr. Pangloss behind the bushes, giving a lesson in experimental physics to her mother's chambermaid, a pretty and very obliging little brunette. As Miss Cunegonde took a great interest in science, she breathlessly observed these repeated experiments. She saw clearly the force of the doctor's reasons, the effects, and the causes. She turned back greatly flurried, thoughtful, and filled with the desire to learn, dreaming that she might well be a sufficient reason for young Candide, and he for her. She saw the doctor in the chambermaid uh, doing the do in the park. She met Candide on reaching the castle and blushed. Candide blushed also. She wished him good day in a faltering tone, and Candide spoke to her without knowing what he said. The next day after dinner, as they left the table, Cunegonde and Candide found themselves behind a screen. Cunegonde let fall her handkerchief. Candide picked it up. She took him innocently by the hand. The young man innocently kissed the young woman's hand, with particular ardour. Knees trembled, their hands strayed. Monsieur the Baron Thunderten Tronk, passed near the screen, and beholding this cause and effect, chased Candide from the castle with great kicks on the backside. Cunegonde fainted away. As soon as she came to, she was slapped by the Baroness, and all was consternation in this most magnificent and agreeable of all possible castles. And so here at the end, we see uh, Cunegonde being curious about the adult things, uh, decided perhaps she could learn about them with Candide. Um, and here, her father sees them kissing the horror, um, and in the great over-exaggeration of this book, which always makes me laugh, uh, just throws Candide out. Um, and Cunegonde was slapped by her mom because probably the whole noble's valuing, you know, inexperience in terms of their ladies. And that is the end of chapter one, which is exactly as it describes how Candide got kicked out of his house, pretty much. Um, I hope you liked it. I really, I love reading Candide. I think it's so funny. Uh, and I definitely just love the phrasing in it. And it's, you know, overly fun way of poking its philosophy and super optimistic viewpoints. <laughs> I admit I'm a bit of a mix between a cynic and an optimist, so sometimes I fall on the on the pangloss side of things, and other times I fall on the narrator side of things. So let me know in the comments what you thought about chapter one, uh, if you're interested in hearing more from Candide, if you're not, 
Uh, I apparently also kept my copy of The Great Gatsby, and since that passed into public domain, we can read it out loud. <laughs> uh, so if you'd like some Great Gatsby-ness, I can do that. But I think I have probably too many classics in the work that I need to continue reading out loud to you guys, so maybe we'll leave that for another time. Anyways... Let me know what you think, and I will be glad to see you guys in the next one. Scholastically Natalie is out.